to me, they just took a step sideways. They didn't do anything major this summer. I mean, well, Dante's a good pickup. Yeah. Dante's a good pickup, but you know, the continuity's there. But I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, the Knicks have some really, really good players, but when are they going to get that splashy player again? Right. I've, been, I've been waiting for that, and it's been years of NBA players avoiding wanting to go to the Garden. They love being there as a visiting player, and they love spending their time in New York, but I, I don't know if the New York media, and Zach, you can answer this better. Like, I, I think KD should have went there. Mm. I, I think it would have done wonders for him and his career and, and the spotlight in New York, but that weight of 50 years and not having won a championship, dealing with the, the back page and all that, I, I think it has scared New York from getting that marquee guy that – is a top 15 jersey seller kind of guy and a perennial all-star. I remember a couple of years ago when Zion Williamson was talking about how much he loves playing in, a, in the garden. He wanted to go there. Though. A couple of folks had <laughs> saying, huh, maybe this is the next superstar that we could eventually see in New York. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet, but there is reason for optimism, right? No matter how you look at what the Knicks have done this offseason, because take a look at their assets, right? New York has 11 first round picks at their disposal over the next several years. They could package that up, use them to acquire even more talent. But nobody is better equipped to talk about and evaluate what a front office could do, what a season could look like than our front office insider, Bobby Mark. So, Bobby, I don't know whether or not Stephen A is going to get his wish in terms of Damian Lillard going to New York here. But how well positioned are the Knicks to acquire whatever superstar right becomes available next? I think they're as, they're as well positioned as any team out there. When you look at, you mentioned the draft picks, they can trade eight first round picks, four of their own, four that they've acquired from other teams, including that Dallas first next year. There's no players on this roster that are a max player. They've got eight players between nine and $25 million. They still have young players like Emmanuel Quickly and Quentin Grimes to use in a deal here. And I think they're waiting for the right player, not the next all-star, but the right player. And that player, whoever that's going to be, could it be Joel Embiid a year or two from now? could be there waiting for them here. And as you know, every year there is a marquee player available. Bradley Beal and Damian Lillard this year, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert last year. And I think if you're New York, you're just kind of sitting patiently waiting for that right player. Yeah, I think what some fans would say is, well, we've been patient for a long freaking time. Yeah. When is that patience going to pay off? Zach, is there a, a player that you're looking at when you look at all of New York's assets that you think, OK, it's time, New York. you got to put your chips in. Oh, well, first of all, patience. They made the second round last year. They were one of eight teams left in the entire playoffs. The patience is starting to pay off. That's a real playoff run. That's a real season. And I think that's the point. Mark is right that they haven't been able to get stars to go there in the last 20 years, basically since Melo 10 years ago, because of the continued losing and dysfunction of the team. And the more you put that continued losing and dysfunction in the rearview mirror and operate like a winning team, a smart team with picks to trade, the more the stars around the league begin to notice and say, hey, that city we like, that arena we like, the team seems to be acting kind of normal now. Maybe I'd actually want to hitch my career to that team. So I think that's starting to change. As for what player, I'm not going to name players. I don't want to be unfair to the teams that they're on. I would just say for me, going back to the Lillard thing, a 33-year-old point guard who's 6'2", 6'3", to pair with my other point guard who's 6'6", six six is not the player I'm cashing in my chips for. I'm looking at a big or I'm looking at a big wing, and you can put two and two together and kind of sift around the league and see who that might be in the next six months, 18 months, whatever it is. But those are the kind of player types. If I'm putting all those chips in, those are the players I'm looking at. No, I wonder if, uh, you know, Stephen A. didn't mention James Harden, right? James Harden's available. They could use the scoring boost, right? Like, why? what about that? What do y'all think about that? Bobby? I think it's hard for New York if you're, you know, just trying to get that money there. If you're not willing to give up R.J. Barrett in a mm -hmm. deal, I think Barrett would have to be probably involved in there. I think to add the pieces, whether it be Isaiah Hartenstein or Emmanuel Quickly, uh, young players like that, I think it's just hard to get to the money to work. I think if you're New York, if you had the expiring contract, you certainly have that Evan Fournier contract 
would you add a, an Emmanuel quickly and, and you know whatever another contract to get to the money work in a, in a first or a second yeah. round pick? But I think if you're Philadelphia, that's what you're looking at. You're looking yeah. at a young player picks, like Emmanuel Bobby. quickly. I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking that they yeah. can dangle them. Is, is James worth dangling the picks for? I think he is. I think if you're looking at that Milwaukee first they have and certainly that Dallas first they also have, I think the picks are worth it. I think it's just a hard to come up with a number for a player making $35 million. You'd have to get close to about 30 um, Fournier would give you a good start, but then you have to keep on adding. Hartenstein and I think quickly would be those two other players that would get you to that number. Well, we will continue to wait to see if the Knicks are going to push their chips in on that next superstar player in Stephen A., Maybe, just maybe, it'll be Damien Lillard if he expands his list. Bobby Marks, as always, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Jalen Brown has put pen to paper on his NBA record five-year, $304 million extension. He chose to hold yesterday's news conference at MIT, the site of Juice's Bridge Program, which is focused on promoting education in underrepresented minority communities. Just incredible work that Jalen Brown is doing in Boston in his community. Now, Bobby, we have been expecting this deal, right, for a while now, but now that it's actually done, what's your reaction to seeing these numbers in print? Yeah, I mean, the numbers are high, certainly. $304 million, the largest contract in NBA history here, but it's the system. It's the system of the salary cap growing year after year. Remember, Malik, in 2015-16, that same Jalen Brown contract was worth $130 million Ooh. here. And I would certainly rather have Jalen Brown on a $304 million contract in, in an extension than Jalen Brown in the last year of his contract. And I think if you're Boston, with Jason Tatum up next year for 338, that's his number, you, you can trade Jalen Brown if you had to a year from now or two years from now because he's still in the prime of his career. Mm, Mark, you broke the news, and I saw you tweeting some of the details, or whatever it's called now, Xing some of the details. Can you explain <laughs> maybe some of the interesting parts about these different payments? Well, the first payment will be on July 1st next year, and it's going to be seven million seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand and seven hundred and seventy-seven dollars uh, to celebrate his number seven and his Juice Foundation, and which is spelled with a seven. Yep. But you know. His agent, the Glushan, Jason Glushan, he messed up. It should have been July 7th. That was oh, the only thing he like. And the he great, could go back and change it, I hope. The but, great uh, Jason Glushan. I mean, he I know. Yeah. all about He had it count. all to the. <laughs> all the way down to the last seven. Hey, but with that money, I'll take it six days earlier. I'll get over it. That's right. Yeah. See, I think it's all going to be fine. <laughs> and I should love the check. As, as we say hello to yeah, a woman yeah. who needs no introduction, our Ramona Shelburne. Ramona, I think one of the things that we've talked about now that this deal has been signed is what is it going to look like, this partnership between Jason Tatum, between Jalen Brown for years to come? You've covered Jason Tatum as closely as any reporter in the league. Yeah. How do you see that forming? Well, look, I mean, one of the things that, that Jalen said yesterday at his press conference was – I'm really going to miss Marcus Smart. That's like the, my closest friend on the team, and it's not going to be the same to be on this journey without him. And so, you know, the, the Celtics did something very interesting to their team this year. Is they they took Jason Jason Tatum's best friend Grant Williams and and, Mar and Marcus Smart, who is who is Jalen Brown's best friend on the team, and those two guys are gone. And generally speaking, when you have a player of this magnitude, you want them to have their guy on the team, the people that they feel comfortable with. But clearly that chemistry did not enter the – either didn't enter the equation or was part of the equation of why they decided to change around this team and its construction. We'll see yeah. how it plays out in the locker room going forward. Well, there's some other things, some interesting things coming out of yesterday's media session. Head coach Joe Mazzulla, he also confirmed that Derek White is going to be the starting point guard for this team. Now, White started 70 games last season, right, for the departure of Marcus Smart, as you mentioned, Ramona. It's going to lead to some role adjustments here. Zach, yep. when you look at these new-looking Celtics your first impressions are what yeah it's not a surprise Derek White is going to start to me the question is I think we know four starters Derek White Jason Tatum Jalen Brown and Kristaps Porzingis who's making too much money to bring him off the bench that means one of Robert Williams and Al Horford is going to be the fifth starter you'd probably guess Horford just because he has a lot more experience playing yeah. with centers but we'll see my first impression is Marcus Smart gone Grant Williams gone. That leaves a void not only in the locker room and all that kind of stuff, but just in how this team played on the floor yep. and their ability to switch across almost every position defensively in the sheer number of guys they had that could function as a screener, as a passer, as a point guard. And in their place is a stretch five in Kristaps Porzingis, who had a great year last year yep. in Washington 
with no stakes, playing for nothing, playing for ping pong balls, who's also had injury issues throughout his career, and just as Robert Williams has, just as Malcolm Brogdon has, and Al Horford ain't getting any younger. So those are four of your top seven guys that make you a little worried about injuries, and just the identity of this team I understand why they thought we keep running into the same problems on offense every year in the playoffs. We got to change something, but it's a it's one of the biggest risks I think that any team took this offseason was messing with what they had mm. to bring in a guy in Porzingis that we haven't seen do all that much on the biggest stage. Well, and that's why when you when you bring up Al Horford starting versus Robert Williams starting, the thing that I immediately think to Mark as well is just the injuries that Robert Williams he was struggling to stay on the floor in the most yeah. important time of year and that was really hard for him he talked about how much he wanted to be out there with this guys bringing in Porzingis you do bring in more of that size do you like these changes I don't know I mean, Marcus Smart was a heart and soul of the team he was the engine and or, or as they say in Boston Marcus Smart and, <laughs> and I, he was so beloved as a player as a person that Porzingis better come with it man. <laughs> like he, he better be the player we've been expecting to be he had a solid season last season and Perhaps we didn't pay much attention to it because he was in Washington, but they're going to need him to be phenomenal because that's a very big time popular player there. But also with Joe Mazzula, I'm happy for him. He has some now some vet assistance with him. Guys that could be future NBA head coaches soon and Charles Lee and Sam Cassell. Yeah, absolutely. Bobby, let me ask you this. The Celtics starting five. Let's just say they're they're white. Brown, Tatum, Porzingis, either Al Horford, Robert Williams, right? So that that is a top what? Is it a top three, a top five, a top ten? Because we know the Celtics, what, what does it all come down to? It's winning banner number 18, and that's it. I think it's top five, and I think more trending towards number five. I think certainly where Denver is and where Phoenix is, and certainly we've talked about Milwaukee, and we'll see what happens with Miami. I think Malika, for me, my concern is what their, their bench is going to look like here. And I think the X factor is going to be Malcolm Brogdon in the health. And this is where it comes with the Tatum and Brown extensions in the future. A bench that is basically filled out with first round picks and players signed to the veteran minimum exception here. And I like their starting five, but eventually you traded Kristaps Porzingis for Marcus Smart and Grant Williams, and you lost one of your key bench players there. At the end of the day, I think we're still looking at the Boston Celtics as one of those upper echelon Eastern Conference teams. I know Miami was the team to represent the East. I still am looking at the Milwaukee Bucks. Yes, Mark, even if you have an issue with them being top two in the power rankings. And the Boston Celtics is leading the way until we see otherwise early on. But only time will tell how their their chemistry is actually going to gel on the court because we have not seen Chris Stapps Porzingis on these big stages. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.